Intended for veterinary professionals, opinions expressed within this content are solely the speakers and do not reflect the opinions and beliefs of Hills or its affiliates. So on the first side of that, the conversation, I love that we're getting into this because the communication elements of how we practice to me are just Ah, I love those conversations and word choices and how do we read the client and engage that conversation in a meaningful, productive way. Hey everyone, welcome back. This episode is sponsored by Hills and features Dr. Christopher Pockel. Dr. Pockel is one of my favorite people to talk to about animal behavior in general. I love his emphasis on client communication when we're working up these cases. And I especially enjoy his insight when it comes to cats and their idiosyncrasies. I mean, can we all agree that cats, they're unique, to put it mildly? The more I learn about them, the more I love them for how just strange and complex and interesting they are. And in this episode, we tackled a topic that I find fascinating, and that's the intersection between feline behavior and disease. It's so interesting how a client may present with a behavior complaint, but when we ask the right questions, they can actually point us in a completely different direction and sometimes right toward a clinical illness in these patients where oftentimes the the kind of telltale clinical signs that we might be looking for are disguised as more subtle changes in behavior. Dr. Packle does a great job of illustrating how some of these, you know, classic clinical signs may be present, albeit, you know, kind of subtle, and how our attention to communication in the exam room and, you know, focusing on asking the right questions helps point us in the right direction and show us that those clinical signs are there and keep us on the right track. Let me introduce him and I'll let him tell you in his own words. Dr. Chris Pockel is a board-certified veterinary behaviorist and is the owner and lead clinician at the Animal Behavior Clinic in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Pockel lectures extensively both domestically and internationally, teaches courses at multiple veterinary schools in the United States, and has authored numerous articles and book chapters for veterinarians and pet owners. He's a sought-after expert witness for legal cases and serves on the editorial advisory board for DBM 360. He's also vice president for veterinary behavior for Instinct Dog Behavior and Training, as well as co-owner of Instinct Portland, which opened in the fall of 2020. You'll see why he is one of my favorite people to talk to about behavior. Let's go ahead and jump into our episode. Join more than 100,000 learners just like you. Vetfolio is one of the largest providers of continuing education for the animal health community, offering more than 500 race-approved CE courses. Earn veterinary CE anytime, anywhere with Vetfolio. Subscribe today at vetfolio.com. All right, for this talk, I'm joined by Dr. Christopher Pockel, who I've been lucky enough to speak to before. And for anyone out there who has heard him, he is just so much fun to talk to, to listen to. And kind of along those lines is how we got here, because I understand you gave a talk at BMX 2024 talking about the interface between feline behavior and disease. And I love that topic because the more I learn about the funny little aliens that are cats, the more interesting they become. So thank you for joining me to kind of dive into this topic. I think that is just the perfect intro (laughs) to this particular subject, the little aliens that live with us and we live with them. And gosh, they're, 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 they're such incredible creatures. And once you really start to understand and peel back those layers, the moments just, they just abound, but you've got to peel back the layers and you got to get curious about how are they the same? How are they different? And so I'm excited to dive into this conversation with you, Dr. Cassie. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the first kind of topic we we decided to jump into here is one that I think is so important because I think, you know, sometimes pet owners, maybe they don't appreciate how significant this can really be. And that's post declaw pain and kind of the effect on cat behavior. I've certainly seen owners kind of find out after the fact, and it's just kind of like, yeah, this is, this is kind of what happens sometimes is it can, it can really, you know, 
create some behavioral issues in the long run. So I'll kind of stop there and turn it over to you. I'd love to hear your thoughts on post-declaw pain and cat behavior. Absolutely. So there's a couple of different angles of this that I think are really important to understand. You know, I think if we're talking within the veterinary field, I think the vast majority of us really have a solid understanding of what that procedure is, where we're talking about digit amputation, right? And so we also know that there's a number of different strategies or different procedures that we can do to perform that. And they have various complications, right? And so the, the issue that we find among a, sort of a couple of different things is if there is that pain, right, there really isn't a way for a cat to avoid it, right? They have to walk on their feet, right? So any level of discomfort that they experience afterwards is going to be clinically significant. Whether we observe it the way that we often think about, let's say, comparing to a dog with an ACL rupture, for example, where there's an acute three-legged lame, you know, it's sort of an obvious gait abnormality or limp. Cats are often not that blatant. And so when we're looking at their pain or their their pain and their their level of discomfort and how they show up, we may see that in a variety of ways, which could be little things like just being a bit more irritable, perhaps, than we might otherwise expect. We could see behavioral changes such as rather than jumping down from an elevated surface, they kind of walk their way down the vertical surface where they kind of brace themselves to minimize the impact of how they might land on the floor. Um, in other cases, we may see elimination changes where they're reluctant to interact with the litter that would require more of a scratching motion. So there's all of these different ways, both sort of obvious and maybe a little bit more covert as well, that we can see that. And I also want to stress while we're talking about pain and discomfort, the stress that goes along with essentially taking away a portion of the cat's normal, necessary behavioral repertoire. When we're talking about cats who are engaging in that scratching behavior, that is, again, not only a normal behavior, but it's actually a necessary behavior from the standpoint of visible and olfactory and pheromonally based communications. And so we are negatively impacting that. And even if we say, well, well, they can still scratch. Yeah, but if there's any, again, any level of discomfort that inhibits that behavior. And so even from those standpoints, before we get into sort of the ethical considerations around declaw, which is a whole, <laughs> potentially a whole other podcast, we're, we're really looking for all of those changes. And I really love for people to be a, really sort of aware of that and mindful of those decisions and make sure that we've really explored the alternatives before we ever get to the point where we're having to have this discussion around declaw associated pain. Absolutely. And I love that the first thing that you mentioned was cats being a little more irritable than they maybe would have been previously because I've certainly seen it where maybe an owner decides to get a cat declawed because they're like, oh, you know, I don't want to get scratched. Well, and then they come back and they're like, this cat bites. And I'm like, well, it probably didn't bite before. But yes, you know, like you said, we've taken away this necessary behavior, this defense mechanism, this this part of the cat's body. And like, you know, like you said, not going way down the rabbit hole of ethical considerations because that's a that's a discussion in and of itself. Um, but, it, you know, I, I feel so many times doing that procedure, we may accomplish, you know, a portion of the goal that that the owner was looking for in in that specific procedure, but we create these other issues down down the line. I think one other thing that I'd like to bring into this conversation too, Cassie, is I recognize that for many of us, when we're navigating this this topic of post declaw pain, we might not be the ones who are in the position of either performing the procedure or even making the decision to perform the procedure. This may be a cat who was surrendered and is now in the shelter system, and now we're dealing with the repercussions of that. And so I want to make sure that as we're having this conversation around this particular topic, that I'm not coming across as overly judgmental, that you know we can have an honest, scientifically validated conversation around this that is separate from the ethical consideration of someone, sh should they or shouldn't they, should they not have you know gone down that pathway? If we have that cat in front of us as a clinician, it's a relevant consideration and one wanting to be mindful of that and even then aware of some of the other sort of implications that if we have a cat who has 
orthopedic pain or post declaw pain, being mindful not only of joint support and any you know, dietary ingredients that may support that, but also being mindful of body condition. And if we're talking about things like jumping or mobility, being mindful that a cat who is carrying excess weight may be exacerbating that discomfort. So we can look at this from a lot of different angles. Absolutely. I'm glad you said that. I kind of like heard it in my own voice too. And I, I had the same thought. I went, I don't, I don't want this to sound like I'm, I'm judging anything out there because I, it, again, like we talked about the ethical considerations, that could be a whole, whole podcast in and of itself because it is nuanced. And, you know, whether it's you're dealing with it and you weren't the clinician who performed it, or, you know, there's a medical something going on that leads to this procedure. There's a lot of considerations that go into whether or not a cat gets declawed. And, and that's not necessarily the consideration here. It's, like you said, how do we address it after the fact? So, so let me turn that over to you. You know, you mentioned body condition score and making sure we keep them in appropriate weight. What, you know, what's, what does the discussion look like with you and pet owners when they say, Hey, we're having these behavioral issues post declaw. So I'm, I'm looking at sort of what I, what I'm seeing in that particular patient. And I'm thinking, for example, of one of my cases that was presented for inappropriate elimination. And as I was watching that cat move, there wasn't anything obvious. Again, at least at first glance, it wasn't limping. It wasn't lame. I didn't see obvious weight shifts. And yet what I noticed was that a, a couple of things. One, as I, this was fortunately a house call. So I was able to see the cat moving throughout its environment. And as I was watching it move, it was tentative. There were very sort of deliberate foot placements. Uh, this was a cat who was slow to move down the stairs, very much sort of one foot at a time versus da -da 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 just trotting down the stairs, which I would have expected for a cat that was roughly four or five years old by by estimations. And so it was some of those, those observations that then made me think and ask the question of the owner, do you see what I'm seeing? You know, you know your cat better than I do. I'm just getting to know them for the first time today, but are these patterns consistent? Is this what you would expect for this particular cat? And if so, then I can tell you that some of those things are at least on the edge of normal. I wouldn't expect to see all of them. And so it gives me a really strong index of suspicion that there is a level of pain or discomfort. And I, I often come at it from that angle of observations first and fact checking that with the owner's observations, because if I just jump in and say, okay, we're gonna go down the rabbit hole of pain control and we're gonna do radiographs, we're gonna do this and that and the other thing, I may get a client who's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I, I, I came to see you because my cat is urinating outside the litter box. I'm not here for radiographs. That's not what we're talking about. And so I need to ideally draw that connection between what their original concern was and why I want to approach it from the angle that I do. Otherwise, we have the potential for having crossed wires within that communication. So I'm looking for all of those things as well as really trying to say, again, objectively speaking, regardless of how I feel about declaw, if that is an element for the cat in front of me, do I actually have observations or data that is reproducible that I could then measure back to that if we go down the pathway of pain control or weight loss or any of those things, do I have a metric that I can compare back to to say, did we actually make a difference in those observations, not only in that case, you know, thinking about the elimination pattern, but also is the cat moving more freely? Is it now jumping more normally off of elevated surfaces? Is it is it changed in a more fundamental way? And that's why those observations for me are so incredibly important. Absolutely. And kind of the things that we would want to address with, say, say weight loss and pain control, those aren't always the easiest things in cats. You know, sometimes our options can get a little bit limited. And, you know, especially with an indoor cat, when we have that talk about weight loss and it's, you know, we need, they're, they're heavy and that's making more pressure on their joints and, and enhancing this pain response that we're seeing. Uh, how do you kind of approach those discussions with the owner, especially because like you mentioned, a lot of times they're there because their cat's peeing outside of the litter box and you've drawn this correlation to, okay, it's because they're experiencing this pain and here's what we're looking for to change it. But particularly around like the weight loss discussion, how do you approach that with owners? And then just for my own curiosity's sake, what do you usually reach for, for pain control in these guys? So on the first side of that, the conversation, I love that we're getting into this because the communication elements of how we practice to me are just 
ah, I love those conversations and word choices and how do we read the client and engage that conversation in a meaningful, productive way. And I think oftentimes I may approach it from the standpoint, especially if what I'm asking of them is going to require some lifestyle changes, either in terms of changing the food they're feeding, the way they're feeding, proactive engagement with activity time to try to increase that calorie expenditure. Some, something is going to require an adjustment for them. And so before I go down the pathway of saying, here's my recommendation, here's what I want you to do, I'm a fan of trying to attach that to what I would consider to be a shared pain point or a shared goal. Are you concerned now that we understand that, yes, in fact, your, your cat is experiencing discomfort, is that a concern for you? If it's a concern, awesome. I've got some strategies that I'd love to share with you that I think would be really helpful. Some of them may include some lifestyle changes for you, but I'd love to run down those options and see what feels like it's more accessible for you. Does that sound like a good way to move forward? So looking at that from the standpoint of really trying to say, am I sort of standing shoulder to shoulder with that animal looking at this problem in front of us? Or am I kind of across the table and, and they're saying this and I'm saying this and it has the potential to be more combative? So can I find that sort of shared perspective within the conversation as quickly as possible? Because we all know everybody out there is super busy. Can we identify that common ground of welfare concerns or physical comfort, or even if it's really focusing on the elimination problem that brought them in in the first place? What can we do? What can we agree on and use that as a shared foundation, not only to motivate that initial effort, but let's say we put our plan in place and then we're, we're you know, three weeks down the line or three months down the line. And I get that call from the owner who says, you know, it seemed like it worked for a while, but we're back where we started from. What do we do next? I want to be able to, to kind of come back to that initial pain point and say, gosh, you know, I, I remember when I chatted with you back in March, we were both really concerned about, you know, pain or discomfort or that, that shared goal. Is that still important to you? If it is, is there anything that we decided you were going to do back in March that might have fallen off your radar because other priorities shifted in your life. No judgment, I promise. But this may be a matter of saying the plan that we created is actually still the plan. But if you're not doing it anymore, maybe it's a matter of just sort of dusting off that treatment recommendation and trying again to see whether or not it makes sense. Is that okay? If that doesn't work, awesome. Let's schedule a time to have you come in. Let's reevaluate what's going on and make a new plan that accommodates whatever the concerns are now or whatever is going on in your lifestyle as well. So I'm thinking about all of those angles. Anything you want to add there before I talk about the actual pain control side of that? No, I love that. And like you said, like no judgment because I, I certainly like make plans for myself and then I'm like, nope, didn't stick to that one. And, you know, so we're all busy. We all, and, and it's challenging to implement, especially like weight loss activity and try to find the times to incorporate some of this other stuff. You know, we know cats can be, finicky sometimes with what they're willing to eat. So there's lots of challenges that are presented when we're putting these plans together. They're not always perfect the first time around and we have to edit them. It kind of makes me think of like when we're talking particularly, you know, I'm thinking of like heartworm and flea preventatives and stuff like that. And they say, you know, what's the best one? It's like the best one is the one that you're going to do consistently. So how can we make that happen? How can we make it the easiest? And same thing when it comes to these treatment plans, it might be, well, this sounds great today, but actually after implementing it for two months, this part is unrealistic. So let's edit and find another solution. I love that. I think sometimes when we're looking at, especially some of these chronic therapies, whether it's, you know, allergy control, I have this conversation with some of my dermatologist colleagues frequently, we're looking at the long game here and it has to be doable and sustainable if it's going to have that lasting impact. And so I'd much rather come at it from the standpoint of saying what's doable for you, you know, how many minutes of exercise or what the budget might be for food changes, for example, what's doable, let's start there, and then let's reevaluate just how much of an impact we had. If we started out with what was doable and it worked exactly as we wanted it to, amazing, win-win. If it didn't, then we have to acknowledge that we're either going to have to up-level our commitment or downgrade our expectations. And that's a separate conversation. But I'd rather start from that angle rather than saying, no, the treatment is this food, this amount, this much exercise, 17 times a day, go, 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 go. If it's not doable, then when I come back to that recheck and the, and the client's giving me potentially even a bit of an untruth in terms of what they've actually implemented, 
Now, as the clinician, I'm flying blind. I know they didn't do it, but I don't actually know what they did to know how to modify that plan. And so now I'm just, you know, offering treatments like a scatter plot, and it just isn't as likely to impact things. So that communication and transparency and trust is so, so important. Absolutely. And on the pain control side, I love the fact that you mentioned sort of the what's doable piece, because that's another place here where, you know, historically, we didn't have a lot of great chronic pain control options for cats. And that is changing. You know, we maybe not have, maybe, maybe we don't have as many options for cats as we have for some other species, but it is dramatically increased compared to even a couple of years ago. So I'm going to have that conversation with the owner and talk to them again. What's the practicality of weight loss and what sort of an impact do we have there? Are we talking about nutritional additives that may have more of a joint support pathway to their, to their efficacy? We're going to feed them anyway. So if we can feed a food that includes those and it's palatable to the cat and it meets all their other needs, amazing. Let's go down that pathway. Are we talking about adjunctive pain control with something like gabapentin or pregabalin, for example, as a way of mitigating that pain response, maybe not going down the non-steroidal route for cats, but can we go down that pathway of pain control, especially knowing that gabapentin and pregabalin can also have some anti-anxiety effects. So if we have that cat who is uncomfortable or painful, and that's manifesting as some emotional changes, sometimes getting a, a, a one-stop shop for multiple interventions can be really, really helpful for those cats. And then of course, we've got some of other, other, other options like the monoclonal antibodies with a once a month injection, that if it's a cat who travels well, can go to the veterinary clinic on a once a month basis, that may be the most practical option and a great way to move them forward. But I wouldn't say that any one of those options is always the first step. It's the conversation with the owner, getting to know that particular patient, what's doable, and then let's see what sort of an impact it has. Oh my goodness. I had this little kitten come in yesterday. She was supposed to get blood work. I think it was pre-op blood work. And I had... She, she was nuts. You know, she was like your typical kitten that was just all over the place. And as soon as you tried to hold her, she grew eight legs and she wasn't mean, but she was just like, you can't hold me down. And um, so I gave her gabapentin and brought her back. And I thought I gave her a pretty decent dose. And I guess she was like relaxing in the lobby. And then a technician came and got me and said, she's like a rotisserie chicken. I said, what do you mean? And as soon as we got her into the treatment area, she was in her carrier, just like rotating just over and over and over. And I went, okay, well, that wasn't clearly wasn't the right drug for you. We're going to have to find another solution here. Now we know, let's put that in the record. Yes. Let's not do that again. Let's try something different. Oh, it was like, it was because she didn't seem distressed at all. She was just like, it was almost like, I feel amazing and bouncing around. So I, they're just, they're so unique. They're so funny. Okay. Anyway, getting off topic there. I love that we're really focusing on client communication here because I'm with you. I love these conversations and it's part of that, like those puzzle pieces and really figuring out the solution and solving the mystery that, that I get so intrigued by in veterinary medicine. And I, I love having the conversations and seeing the light bulbs come on for owners. Um, so along those same lines, can we talk about polyphagia, particularly, you know, we see hyperthyroidism, diabetes mellitus, things like that in cats. Um, but sometimes that, you know, we know polyphagia is a, a presenting sign of that, but sometimes that's not always what the owners are initially describing. Um, and that can take some, some nuanced communication. So can you dive into that complaint a little bit? Absolutely. So I think when I'm thinking about polyphagia as a clinical sign, you know, we're looking at that in terms of increased appetite or increased consumption of food, food-based items. And so, you know, what we're expecting to hear from a client is they're ravenous, they're demanding food, they are trying to steal the dog's food, they're grabbing food off my plate, like all food related things. And that's great. We can absolutely look for those, ask about those, listen for those, and thinking about what are some of the other impacts of hunger. So if we have an animal that, let's say it's a single cat household, there's no other pets, we don't have any other food around, how might hunger an unsatiated hunger, how might that show up? So we may see irritability, especially in the two to four hours prior to mealtimes. So asking the client, is there any sort of episodic or variable nature of those observations? If you're describing your cat as just a bit more cranky, I'm not sure what's going on, but she's upset in a way that she wasn't before. 
awesome. Do you see that more likely at certain times of day? And can we tie that to any particular activities? In some cases that may take us down a rabbit hole, oh, she's really cranky when the kids get home from school, which may have nothing to do with hunger or appetite. <laughs> But if we say, no, actually, even on the weekends that let's say 4 to 6 p.m. or 3 to 7 p.m., she's she's really irritable. She's seeking me out. She's vocalizing. She's just agitated and restless. Cool. You know, when we think about working with a toddler, for example, on the human side, we ask those questions, right? Do you need to be changed? Do you need food? Do you need sleep? Like, have your basic needs been met? And hunger is one of those that can show up as, again, agitation, irritability, restlessness, that you have a need, but I can't put my finger on what that actually is, sort of a sense. So I'm looking for those things as well as other observations like a cat who's getting into the trash, for example. We typically think about that as more of a dog-related concern. But if the client's like, oh my gosh, my cat is getting into everything, he's chewing on things throughout the house in a way that he's never done. Like all of those things that we think about ingestive behaviors and oral behaviors, if we have an unmet need such as hunger or that polyphagia, that ravenous appetite, it can show up in a lot of different ways. So, you know, especially when we have a client who's saying, this is what my concern is. Awesome. We can totally address that. Let's, let's, let's tease that out a little bit. Tell me more about what you're actually seeing and getting back to the discrete observations, because if the owner has observed some things and they've now formed a story and they're sharing the story with you, the data points that they use to form that story might have actually led you as the clinician down a completely different path. And if we get sucked into the story and we're now trying to create a differential diagnosis list for the story or the interpretation that the client has created, we might be spinning our wheels when in fact, if we got a different data set, we may have a very different picture in our own head. Oh gosh, good old Dr. Hill on my very first clinical rotation. I came back and I gave him a history, you know, how, like scary that is as a student. And I said, yep. And this dog has had pancreatitis, you know, previously and all this. And he said, well, how do you know the dog's had pancreatitis? And I'm like, I don't know, the owner told me he had pancreatitis. And he said, well, what was the dog doing that made him think the dog had pancreatitis? Are we sure it was pancreatitis? I was like, oh no, the owner said it, the record said pancreatitis. And it did turn out like we went down a whole different road. And I will never forget that conversation where he said, just, just because like you said, the owner has this story, the owner has this narrative, doesn't mean you don't have to put on your critical thinking hat and really work through what led them to that conclusion. And is, and you know, as does your training as a veterinary professional support the narrative that, that they, they think is in front of them? Absolutely. And those labels are so important, right? You know, we could go down other pathways if we were talking about sort of the difference between vomiting and regurgitation, for example. Yes. Client says, you know, they're vomiting. And then when we actually see it, we're like, no, no, that's not what's happening. Or the client who comes into a behavior clinic and says, my cat is spraying. I assume spraying is marking and they're depositing urine on that vertical surface in a horizontal urine stream. I've had so many clients over the years that basically describe any sort of inappropriate urination as spraying, peeing outside the litter box equals spraying. So even just making sure when you say spraying, do you mean this or you mean this? And using very discrete pictures that don't have any sort of overlap between them to make sure that the label the client has put on that story is in fact the accurate one for what's going on. And I think there's a level of nonverbal communication that comes from us in those moments that at least at least when I'm when I'm having a good day and doing my job, right? You know, for example, the the cat getting into the trash to say, huh, that's just not something that cats normally do. Um, that's a unique behavior. So let's let's dig into that a little bit more. And I think that like that pause, that puzzlement, which are very genuine, kind of open that door for the owner of like, Let's really dissect this and let's really find out what the subtleties around this are, because that's what's going to give us our answer. That's what's going to point us in the right direction, not, you know, treating exactly what we're talking about here today, because like a, a behavioral issue for a cat acutely getting into the trash, like that would just be, I mean, not to say it couldn't happen. It would just be a really weird thing to happen. <laughs> It's, it's amazing. And once you get that level of curiosity, and as you, I love how you described that sort of puzzlement pause, like, I don't have to be sort of deer in the headlights. Right. Of, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do with that information right. back on my heels, but rather hmm, tell me more. And I love having a sort of 
I'm going to say a canned response or a scripted response that whenever I'm working with a client or, or my husband for that matter, um, <laughs> who tells me something that I need to tease out and I'm not ready to respond yet because the response that's going to come out of my mouth in that moment is probably not going to be helpful for the conversation is tell me more about that. What did you mean? Can, can you tell me that another way? I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to hear something, whatever verbiage comes to you, but it's amazing. Even if you're literally just using it as a stalling technique to give yourself a little bit more processing time, it can be incredibly helpful either to get you more information or to give you the time you need to really tease it out. Oh, I love that. That's such good advice. And, you know, something I, I think, yeah, probably mine is like that, that puzzlement, like, huh, that's an interesting thing. Tell me more. But probably something I'll do a little bit more consciously going forward. But curiosity, too, there's a sort of the difference between sort of leaning in or backing away from the conversation. You mentioned body language there, too, that if I'm truly, genuinely asking, tell me more. But if I said, tell me more. And everything else in my body language indicated detachment or tell me more. And then I'm writing my notes in my records and I'm really not attending to the client. That can really come across as disingenuine and, you know, almost just not, not, not as helpful versus being mindful of our body language. I know we're distracted. I know we need to take those notes, but being mindful of our body language and how we're communicating. So if I'm asking the client genuinely, tell me more, I'm probably going to lean in just that little bit of, you know, little bit, just that little slight lean, engage eye contact if that's comfortable for that particular client. Um, you know, tell me more. I'm going to jot some notes down and just kind of giving them a bit more clue as to how we're navigating that. So I get to do what I need to do, but I'm also pulling the client into the conversation to give me the information that I need. And those little subtle things, especially when we're busy, I love how you said that before, when I'm showing up and doing my job well, versus when I've got three procedures waiting for me in treatment, and, 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 and my brain is going into task completion mode, it's really hard to be present and to show up for that conversation regardless of whether we're talking about, you know, any of these topics with cats or something else entirely got to show up. The clients will know the difference. Absolutely. Absolutely. And especially with cats, because they are strange little creatures who have very subtle behaviors. And if you're up for it, I'd love to jump into another situation that I've heard about that I know can be really challenging for clients to navigate and also like hard for us to advise veterinarians and that's new relationships. So, you know, maybe there's, there's a new significant other who has, is spending more time at the house or a cat owner who's spending more time away from the house to, to spend time with a new person, whatever that relationship is. And the cat is not happy about that and is manifesting that maybe as inappropriate elimination or tearing things up that they, they weren't doing before or, you know, some undesired behavior, I have found that situation to be particularly challenging because, you know, I'm, you kind of have to get some details, but I'm like, I don't want to pry into your business here. I don't want to tell you to change your life. I don't want to tell you your cat is telling you to run, but, um, but you know, how do I, how do I accomplish our goal here? So I would love to hear your input on that type of a situation. Oh, that's a fun one. And you're absolutely right that there's, there's so many layers to that communication and it can really blur the line between sort of professional and personal relationships when we need to cross into some of that territory that might might uncover some stress within a new relationship or sometimes clients voluntarily share information that we didn't actually ask for and now we're now now we're stuck navigating that in our own world but i i think when when i'm i'm thinking about some of the ways in which that particular scenario can show up i think you hit some some really really good ones whether it's inappropriate elimination or a client who says i think my cat has separation anxiety or if they're saying you know she's getting into whatever she's waking me up in the middle of the night things are things are different you know i'm i'm seeing different changes what do we do about it I'm thinking about all of the different things that could show up either medically or socially and environmentally that might manifest in those ways. And so when I think about my differential list, you know, yes, as a veterinarian, I'm of course screening for you know, endocrine disorders and physical discomfort and all of those things that we're, that we're thinking about, but also asking the question, is there anything in the environment from your cat's perspective that has shifted? And that's a really important piece of the question from your cat's perspective. If you think back over the last week, month, three months, whatever time period we're talking about, 
is there anything that would be different from your cat's perspective? And the reason I like that is number one, it's ultimately the cat's perspective that we want to get. They're the one who is experiencing stress or emotion, you know, emotions that are different for them that are showing up in a different way. And so I want to be able to tap into that as best I can. And what I find as well is if I say, is anything different? And I'm sort of leaving it like, have you done anything different? Has your schedule changed? Are you doing anything different? Some of our clients can take that as a bit more kind of critical or or blame focused. Like, what did you what did you do? What did you do that's causing what did you do to this poor cat? <laughs> this poor innocent cat who is different. Yeah, and clients, even though that's not what we're asking, it's not what we're saying, some clients can hear it that way. So I find that sort of centering it from the cat's perspective, even just saying, hey, is there anything that's different? Anything that might have changed your schedule, the time you're spending together, the type of activities that you're doing, you know, is there anything that has shifted? And really leaving it sort of open-ended. And if a client then comes back and says, well, yeah, I'm seeing somebody new or, you know, there's this new relationship in my life or maybe it's a relationship that has ended or some sort of transition there. Then I can ask that follow-up question without diving into the relationship. I can steer it back to, okay, that's good to know. That, you know, again, let's tease that out. Let's Let's dive into that a little bit. I don't necessarily need to know the intimate details of your relationship. But if you think about what that looks like for you and whoever your significant other is or whoever the other involved parties are in this conversation, what might look different from, you know, from your cat's perspective? And again, is it time spent away? Is it more time with individuals spending time in your home? Is it the variability of the schedule versus maybe you were much more routine oriented before? So now meal times are disrupted. Or if you're spending multiple days away and you've got someone stopping by to take care of the cat, are they scooping the litter box the way that you would normally do historically, or has that shifted as well? And trying to tease out again, what are the variables that we can then say, okay, I think that that problem you're describing of defecating outside of the litter box, for example, if we think that that's coming from a place of hygiene or litter box management, awesome. I can, I can really lean into that and say, what are the different ways that we can approach that particular issue, even as a hypothesis to say, if we address that, if we are now making a diligent effort to scoop the box twice a day, for example, or whatever it is that we're doing, does that make a difference? And I don't have to necessarily dive into the relationship and asking, well, do you think this relationship is a good move for you? Is it, we, we, we do not need to go down the marriage, family therapy, counselor direction, and yet the line gets blurry because I actually need some of that information in order to do my job. So how do I ask the questions in a way that kind of keeps the blinders or the, the boundaries in place, but still provides me the information I'm looking for? And I love listening to you explain these because you're you're giving examples, which I feel like I, I have found helps owners a lot in the exam room where it's like, has anything changed like X, Y, or Z, you know, for an example, because I know I've had, I'm thinking of one cat in particular who would actually love to hear if you've ever seen anything like this or, or had this kind of subtlety. It was a cat who was inappropriately eliminating and we're, you know, trying to dig into what's changed, what's changed, what's changed. A chair had been moved from one side of the room to the other, and the cat was not okay with it. That chair needed to go back, and the cat was going to pee outside of the litter box until they moved the chair back. They moved the chair back. Everything was fine. And so I love to give owners examples like that where I'm like, it doesn't have to be a big change. This can be so subtle. Like you moved a piece of furniture, and your cat's not okay. I, yeah, you're absolutely right. The, with those particular changes, cats, especially those that tend to be more routine oriented, a unsanctioned environmental yes. adjustment is not okay. And I love that because now that gives me an inroad to say, okay, well, if that degree of environmental change had that big of an impact, I wonder whether there's an underlying level of anxiety or need for absolute predictability that might benefit from you know, some sort of intervention, whether that's enrichment, whether it's a change in the social interaction, whether that's looking at some of our food additives that could have a calming effect. Again, I'm not saying we're going to jump right to the Prozac fluoxetine option, but if we recognize that this is a cat who is really easily upset by social or environmental changes, it opens up a potential conversation. What are some of the things that we can do to provide some support 
around that and where do we go from there? But first we have to really identify, again, what's the stressor? What do we think is going on? And how do we reframe that in a way that actually lends itself to solutions rather than the owner thinking, well, I guess this boyfriend's out of the picture, you know, can't do that anymore. So now, and one other layer, if we've got the time for it, Cassie, is, you know, in that scenario, when we're talking about inappropriate elimination and, and relationships, one of the ones that I hear, I almost sort of laughter, as, even as I said it out loud, is that that sort of, you know, that, that conversation where the owner's like, oh yeah, you know, the cat is defecating outside of the, out of the litter box. I'm like, okay, well, tell me more. Where is it happening? And when it's like, well, he's pooping on my boyfriend's pillow. Oh no. You know, or so boyfriend, girlfriend, like. Right. The, 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 the new individual was not approved. And what I find in that scenario, especially when we spend all of this time in other conversations telling our clients, you know, cats do not eliminate outside of the litter box because of spite or jealousy or any of those sort of those emotional reactions. And then we get a scenario like that and the client's looking at you like, are you sure? Are you sure there's not a spite element to what's going on here? And so I, I love having, a, again, a, a way of reframing that. And I, I often describe that to the clients as saying, well, I'm I'm pretty sure, still pretty sure it's probably not spite or your cat trying to chase the boyfriend off. With that being said, the fact that there's a change in behavior does suggest that your cat has some pretty big feelings about this and they're expressing it in the only way they know how to do. So can we unpack that again? What has changed from your cat's perspective? So it's a way to, even in those scenarios where we think there's a really personal, emotional impact of whatever that behavior is, reframing it to get it back to, yeah, this may be something where your cat does in fact have really big feelings. Let's tease that out. Let's provide the support they're looking for. And then let's see what sort of an impact that has. Absolutely. I think that's all great advice. I love talking to you about all of this. You have such great insight, of course, on the medical side of things, but client communication and how important that is and, and just those subtleties that we come across that really complete the picture there. So as always, this has been such a fun conversation just in the interest of us not sitting here and talking for another hour about this, because I know that we absolutely can. Any final thoughts you want to share and make sure we all take home from this conversation? one especially when cats are involved is be curious the number of times where i'm working through feline histories you know where there's some degree of behavior change and i discover elements that i honestly have to say wow i've, I've never actually i've never actually heard that particular combination of details before i wonder what that means right i think there's you know i don't want to say that cats are a mystery that we'll never understand but I do think that our overall level of understanding is not adequate for all of those things, especially when we think about the fact that cats are perhaps less domesticated than the dogs are that we work with. They haven't been modified as much over the time. There are some exceptions. Persians, I'm talking to you. But if we're, <laughs> if we're thinking about some of the cats that we're working with, they have a lot of their sort of wild type characteristics. And we don't have visibility, most of us, of what that would actually look like to understand the motivations. So be curious about what you're seeing versus jumping to, oh, I saw a case just like this before, boom, and now we've made an assumption and we're launching into treatment before we might have really understood what the nuances might be for that particular cat. So bottom line, be curious, ask questions, and don't feel bad if you don't actually know the answer because cats can be confusing sometimes. They can, they can. There's, and, and that's what's so fun is because it's not just helping the owners have these light bulb moments. Like we have these moments too, where it's like, I figured it out. This is so exciting. So I love that advice to be curious because they will, just when you think you've got it, they'll throw you a curveball. Percent. Well, Dr. Poggle, thank you again for joining me. So much fun. I can't wait to release this episode. I'm sure everyone out there is going to have as much fun as we did and get a lot out of it. Thanks for having me on today, Cassie. I really appreciate it. I loved that conversation. I've certainly experienced just the subtlety of those clinical signs in my own patients and Figuring out the importance of communication in those circumstances, it's like solving a puzzle, which I love. Dr. Pockle, thank you so much for joining me. Always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you to Hills for making this episode possible. And of course, thank you everyone out there who tuned in. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. 
It'll help other veterinary professionals out there find this and other great episodes we try to put out there. If you'd like to hear more episodes, click on the Education tab on the Vetfolio website. As always, we'd love to hear your input on this talk as well as ideas for topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. Feel free to reach out to me at dvm at vetfolio.com. You can also visit my Facebook page at Dr. Cassie DVM, and you can find me on LinkedIn. And remember, if one animal is better off because of you today, it's a great day. Mm-hmm.